Welcome. Today is the 11th day of Tammuz, the 17th? I guess it's the 17th of uh, July. So we're going to do a, a quick review on what we've seen so far. Okay. So the, the first thing he taught us was the difference between Kriya Shema and Davening and Tefillah, between reciting the Shema and the Amida. And he told us that actually when we sit down, we're in the world of creation. When we stand up, we're in the world of emanation. This is a general principle in the Zohar. And then we have this thing that when we say Shema, we sit down. It's even according to the Mkubalim, it's uh, according to Allah, you don't have to sit down. But, but according to the Mkubalim, you should. And it's an interesting thing because actually when you sit down and you're, you're, when you're, you're in the world of creation, you are able to cause a unification that's higher. It's a unification of the intellect, the Abba and Ima, the father principle and the mother principle. But when you're standing up and you're in the world of emanation, of Atzilut, so all you can do is Yichud Zun, which is the small continents and the feminine. And they're lower. So right, they're usually the emotions and the habits and reality. So that's where you're unifying. So it's the intellect, which is the highest, like the head of the person, that's where the intellect is. Then you go down to the heart and the uh, kidneys. Those are the aspects of uh, of zun, of zeh and pin and nukva, the small continents and uh, kingdom. And he wants to explain why this is so. So to, to begin to explain that, and he asked, before we can explain what yichud zun is, what does it mean to unify these two? We have to abstract everything out of the physical counterparts that you might think about. So there's no anthropomorphism here. And so he went into a long, long discussion of what are Sfirot. And in the end, the conclusion was that Sfirot are creations uh, made by God, and they are the way he interacts with a limited reality. Without the Sfirot, there's no way for the infinite to interact with the finite. So he needs to enclose himself, Lit Labesh, within the Sfirot in order to interact with us. It's our shortcoming, it's not his. Mm-hmm. And then he got into the question of the names. What do the names mean? And then he said, all the names are names for God's essence, for, him, for he himself. Essence is the wrong word. I said there's no word for it in English. It's God in and of himself. That's the way we say it in many words. So why are there different names? Because each of the different names is related to one of the sfirot. But it's not that the name itself represents a different aspect of God. They don't. They all refer to God Himself. Aye, so why are there different names, he asked. So he brought us the famous Medrash, uh, the Medrash in Shmos Rabbah, in the beginning of uh, the book of Exodus. And there, Moshe Rabbeinu asks Hashem, when they ask me, what's your name, what shall I tell them? And God says, you want to know my name? I'm known by my actions. And so we understood that each of the names is a different action, it's a different revelation of godliness, but it's not a creation, it's not like the Sfirot. These are names for God Himself, and all the connotations are also the same. So a Sfirah is actually less than even a connotation, because the connotation still refers to God, except that the connotations and the names are referring to God through His actions, what we see revealed. Whereas there's one particular name that Yudke Vavke, the Tetragrammaton, that that speaks as closely as we can to God in and of Himself. But really, he said, God in and of Himself has no names. You can't give Him any names at all. He's nameless because the mind cannot fathom it. So then he came now to another question, and the question was, to whom do the Kabbalists pray? He said, you can't pray to the Sfirot, because Sfirot are just, and we, and we give the whole parable to the Sfirot, is with a cup and what, what's tinted, is it the cup, is it the water, all that, I'm putting that aside because it's not relevant right now. So now we ask, so who do the Kabbalists pray to? And this is not a question that I asked, it's a question from the Middle Ages. Um, somebody from yesterday's class wrote that it was Garona, but it's not Garona. <laughs> I, I didn't have time to look it up. Sorry. Um, so, where were all these Kabbalists? Where were they <laughs> the, sitting? The, the town. In the, in the, in, it's a, it's a with province. There, it's, it's with an N. Narova. Narava. I, I think I, I, I know. I, uh, yeah. I, don't, I can't get the. I, I know what you're for some reason, I'm yeah. drawing a blank. I meant to look um, it up, yes. There was actually. 
here I'll say that I, I do read academic uh, writings and I have at home um, oh I th you know what now that I think of this book I have the notes that Rivka Schatz Oppenheimer she was a she was a researcher in Kabbalah she was a student of Gershom Sholem everybody knows my criticism of Gershom Sholem it's not just mine it's everyone's <laughs> I didn't invent it um, but she sat in his classes and she, she took notes on his class, which is called The Beginning of Kabbalah in Provence. So it's in Provence, according to that book at least. I don't know why it had an, uh, an N at the beginning, but it's not. It's Provence. That's the area of France where they assume that Kabbalah started because that's where the Bahir came from and there's other things as well. In truth, it didn't come from there. It's just a place where people decided, I guess they had more freedom or something, and they decided to speak about it openly. Um, in any case, so the Rivash, I remember yesterday it was Yitzchak Bar Sheshis, that's his name, um, he asked this of a Mekubal that he knew at the time, and he told him, we never dove into the Sfirot, but let me explain to you why we have the Sfirot in mind, because when you come to a king and you want something done, so you don't come to the king and uh, ask him when he's... Uh, uh, when he's busy with his treasury to do something that's related to his judgment and not vice versa. And you have to come to the person who's responsible for the king's time on that particular subject. So then the final answer that he had, and he said, and, and he had another friend that he said, Nisim, what was his name? Um, sorry, Shimshon de Kinun. And he asked him about the same, same question. And he said that we are not like the Kabbalists, this was apparently someone who was not a Mekubal. And he said, we daven to whoever the child davens yeah, to. Right, right. We don't have anything in mind. And comes the Tzemach Tzedek, and that's what we finished with last time. Good. And we said, so why, do, why even get into this whole thing? And I kept saying, you know, if you have a bureaucratic mind, maybe that's the way you should see things. But if you don't have a bureaucratic mind, it's just simple. And, that, and that's really the way that a child is. So it's better to just be a child. That's basically what he's saying. But remember, the initial question was, what do these yichudim, what, what are these unions between Abba and Ima, the father and mother, and between the Zun, Zer and Pina Nukva, what do they mean? And why do we do them here, do we do them there? He still wants to answer that. So he, he doesn't want to leave it like, okay, so just ignore all this, yeah. because otherwise he wouldn't start with it. He could yeah. have just said in the beginning, you know what, the Mekubalim say there's all these unifications, we don't do that. We just we just uh, have in mind that we're praying to God. We don't care about all these things. But obviously, that's not the direction he wants to go. He he just wants to abstract it a lot. So he doesn't want to have what the Kabbalists have in mind. He wants to have something similar but much more abstract. So that's where we're getting to now. And we're at the end of chapter eight, or rather the bit, the the middle of chapter eight. And now he's going to raise a question. He says the parable that this Kabbalist from wherever he was that the Rivash from Yitzchak Bar asked him about who do you pray to he gave this parable that you come to the king and you have to get the right minister you have to get the right guy right? you can't, you can't just go, you, you don't just go to the king himself because there's somebody, there's somebody who's managing his time somebody who's responsible for this it's just the way you know, the kingdom works a, a court works. So he says, so there's a problem with this, and now he's going to raise the problem. Because this parable doesn't, it doesn't fit what he's trying to tell us about. And he assumes that this Kabbalist is not making a mistake. He's, he's just, we need to understand it better, what he's, what he's trying to say. We have to understand his words more carefully. That the person who is now meditating on this, thinking about this and following what I'm saying, he shouldn't think that the parable is exactly like what it's meant to signify. So the sig signifier is not the same as the signified. The signifier is that you go to some person who's responsible, not the king himself. And the, the signifier, the, what's being signified is Hashem. So it doesn't work. Why? The 
This works for discussing Sfirot. Why? Because we said Sfirot are like creations. Mm-hmm. They're like this yeah. person who's responsible. And when Hashem wants to give you loving kindness, He should use Chesed. When He wants to give you judgment, He should use Din. That's how He distributes it. So there, it seems to be the same. And... This is a little tricky here. And it would seem that the Sfirot... He's not going back on this. He's still saying the Sfirot are creations. But now he wants to say that in the parable, there's something wrong with the way he's presenting it. It seems to be something wrong. It's not understood. Why? Because the minister and the king are two separate people. But, and it's... And it turns out, what he's saying here is, if you follow this through, So in the end, it turns out that the minister of, of justice, he's the one who tries the case, not the king. That, that's, what he said. that's how the parable comes out. And the same thing is true about the uh, money, if you're asking for funds. That the, whoever's uh, the exchequer, he's the guy who gives you the check. Lo ha-melech. It's not the king, but rather the king is the one who commands him to write the check. And then he says, And it's not the same thing by God. Why? Because we have a Mishnah at the end of chapter 4 of Avos. And listen to what this Mishnah says. It says, in short, he writes here, In short, he is the creator, he is the judge. There's not two different... Um, not two different uh, people here, two different entities. God does everything. The full Mishnah is like this. Rabbi Elazar Kapar Omer, Rabbi Elazar the Kapar says, who, uh, those who, are, who have been born will eventually die. And those who died will eventually be born again. And those who are alive have to be judged. Ladin uh, have to be judged. Ve'yada lehodia o lehodia shehu kel hu ayotzer. And the whole purpose of life was, and the whole purpose of the judge, this judgment, is for the person to know and to be able to testify, to witness that he is God, he is the Creator, he is the for, for, former, the one who gives form to things. Who am I He is the one who understands. Here it means he understands all their hearts. He knows everything that's in your heart. Who a dayan? Who ed? He is the judge and he is the witness, which you can't do in a regular court. The judge can't be a witness and the witness cannot, cannot be a judge. Who bal hadin? Vehu atid ladun? He is also the one who comes to contest. Don't think that there is a Satan there who is coming to, to say, oh, look at what he did. It's God himself who comes. And he's the one who's running the whole court. He's everything. He's the court itself. So don't think for a second there's something else. This is what the Mishnah mm-hmm. at the end of Avos, this is a Mishnah uh, 24. It's almost the end of chapter 4. So all this is in, we're reading, somebody asked here, Derech Mitzvot Techa, from the Tzemach Tzedek. Okay. Shorish Mitzvah Satfila. I guess I didn't say that in the beginning this time, because we're doing a review. Okay. So it's all the same. And even though the judgment comes down through the sphere of might, of gvura, like we said, it's not God himself. Even though it is divine. And we said that's the big topic about what, is, what are the sphere of are they divine or not divine? What does that mean? Even mean in, in the Tanya is two, two epistles dedicated to this. In any case, you can't say that it's the sphere that's doing something. It's not doing something. It's from the Creator. And He's the one who's judging. And He's using the instrument of the sphere, but it's Him. Again, why would He use the instrument of the sphere? Because otherwise, and I'll come back to this in a moment, we're not going to get to it today, but He'll come, he'll come back to this at the end of the chapter, because we are limited in our ability to understand infinite justice. Mm-hmm. So there has to be a sphere that gives justice. Mm-hmm. 
but it's not the sphere deciding anything. The yeah. sphere is just like a contraction. Mm -hmm. It's coming and saying, whatever was in the mind of the infinite is now being presented, because in the end, the what does the mission say? That you have to testify that he is God. You have to see that he knows everything in your heart. You have to see that this is, it, that was the whole point of being in this world. Right? The whole point of being in this world is for a person to have free will, to act, and then, like it says at the beginning of Tukun Ezor, La Chaza, to see what is this world, why does everybody want this world? Because of the free will in it. That's why people want to stay alive. They want another moment of deciding something. And at the end, they will give uh, an accounting for everything that they did. Because that's what it means to have free will. That then somebody can review what I did and say, say, this was in your heart, this is what you wanted to do. And so he is the judge. And he is the one who's giving the check through the sphere of chesed. Otherwise, yeah. the check couldn't be cashed because nobody has that much. Nobody has that. It's like going to, to the, to the Makolit, to the, to the convenience store with a, a block of gold. <laughs> they can't do anything with it. And not that the way you under, understand from the parable that it's somehow the minister himself who's doing it and not the king. Yeah. Meaning that, the, in, again, in the parable, it seems to be something separate. So he says, as much as we say the spirit are separate, they are creations, still it's Hashem doing it. He's just doing it. He's contracting it through this particular channel. Okay, so we will continue, God willing, tomorrow. Yeah.